Marty Watt is our guest. We are at the Clemson Extension Office in downtown Anderson. Tell me about growing up down in the uh, Star Iva area. Very rural areas, especially uh, at that time. A lot of folks were kin. If they weren't kin, we claim one another because the families had grew up and, uh, in the same areas for, for many years. And uh, it was a simple life, but a, but a good life. I mean, we enjoyed ourselves. We grew up in 4-H. Uh, here in Anderson, and of course, 4-H is kind of a, a lead into FFA activities. For those that may not be aware of those national conferences that you went to in Kansas City, now they're in Louisville, you've got 50,000 FFA members oh, from yeah. around the country, all those blue jackets, and yet there's no trouble. You find a child something positive to do, it gives them a little time to get into development. And, uh, you know, my dad, and my grandfather were firm believers in keeping us busy. I joke around a lot and tell folks that if I, if I told my dad I had somewhere to be on Saturday afternoon, whether it be a date or, or, or going out with friends, he'd find you something to do to dark. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you didn't, he'd let you go about two or three o'clock. He'd say, well, son, I think we've done enough today. And I uh, said, why don't y'all go on and get cleaned up and go enjoy yourself. But it, he believed in keeping you busy. When it came time to start looking at colleges, what were your options? Well, I'll be honest with you, I worked for uh, my ag teacher, uh, Harold Plant Skills, uh, while I was in high school. I also drove a school bus, which people didn't do now, I drove it for two years. So I'd, I'd leave the house in the morning driving the bus. When I'd, when I'd get home in the evenings, uh, I'd get off the bus, change clothes, and go straight to his house. So I did go to Tech for two years. And I continued to work for him in the afternoons when, uh, when I'd get out of school. He had a hog farm. He also had uh, cattle. So we would cut hay, uh, mend fences, feed hogs. Uh, there was a lot of different things that we would do. Whether you do basket weaving or whatever you may do when you're in college, the experiences you gain to do life, basically. Kids need to do something beyond high school you know, learn a trade and, and to go on. So even though it may be a trade that you never use, the knowledge you gain and the experience you gain while you're in uh, higher education, they're going to follow you the rest of your life. Best tools you can have. My entire time that I was at Clemson, Danny Ford was coach. And you know, after I became a county agent years down the road, uh, I worked a little bit in Oconee County and uh, had the pleasure to working with, with uh, Coach Ford on his farm. And uh, he's just as a big-hearted guy yeah. off, the, off the field as he is on the field. How many were agents were in Oconee when you went to work? There were five of us at that particular time in Oconee. And your specialty was what? Then I was, uh, it was general ag. I was doing 4 weights, livestock, uh, row crops, anything, working with soil samples. Anything that came through the door, basically, we were asked to, to handle. And for those, Marty, that may not be aware of what the Clemson Extension agents used to do a lot more than they do now, how would you go about your daily activity? Who would you help? How would they get in contact with you? What was your purpose in being at the Oconee Extension well, office? Back then, we were, and still are to a sense, we were the extension of the, uh, the university. In other words, students would go and sit in a classroom at Clemson University and learn. Our clientele was folks out here in the working world. We would take the classroom to them. Whether that be riding out in the pickup truck and doing a home visit, walking through a field of wheat, or uh, looking at cattle, or, or doing assessments that way. A lot of different things that, that uh, Clemson Extension or any county agent was expected to do at that particular time, um, simply because we didn't have the modern day technologies. You didn't have your text messages. You didn't have your email capabilities, you had to do a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. So therefore, there was a lot more agents in the field. For instance, I transferred to Anderson the following June. Well, when I came here, there was 21 of us. This building was full of county agents. We had four administrative assistants. Uh, at that particular time, you had a county director in every county. You had district directors that were over them, but all 46 counties had a person, and their job pretty much was to keep up with us. And, uh, you know, back years ago, you had the county agent and the assistant county agent. Well, when I came into the picture, we were all considered county agent, but early days, 
the call would come in or the farmer would call the county agent who was you know the the, the oldest used person in the in the building tell them what they needed or what they wanted what they their would, problem was right that, where they, they would, needed help that's right they would send the assistant agent out you would meet with them you would assess what was going on in the field you would come back and report that to the county agent and then that person would contact whoever the uh, the clientele were you didn't you didn't actually meet with them other than doing the assessment but a lot of things have changed. I mean, you know, we, we've had a lot of things this day and time by email, text messaging. Yeah. Uh, they send us pictures. Uh, and, you know, and we have a lot less personnel. I think now, presently in Anderson County, there's three full-time county agents. Now, we have some other folks that work with Clemson in the building, but they're not associated with as far as what we do, 4-H and, and uh, horticulture and ag. Uh, livestock and, and, you know, and row crops and that type of stuff. So you're down to three. Basically. Three full-time and some part-time. Talk to me about the Grove Fire Department where in your community that's a vocal point of what goes on down yes, there in that rural part of the county. Well, Grove Fire Department was established uh, in 1966. My father, my grandfather, and a whole bunch of other folks in the community, uh, Mr. Eric Sampson, uh, Sigler Simpson, uh, some of the Browns, A.N., Levis, all those uh, guys got together. Uh, Doug Gable, he was another one that was instrumental in that time. And they were trying to put a fire department in 3 and 20 area, which is Station 19 now. They talked uh, the commission into allowing them to get the truck. They built the station themselves. Uh, would, would, you know, like, of course, I was there at that particular time, small you know, I wasn't about three or four years old. But you remember but I that. I remember it. I remember being down there playing in the sand pile, yeah. so to speak, uh, when they were building the block building. I joined the fire department back then. You didn't, it's not like now. You didn't have to go through the Boy Scouts or wait till you was 16. If you could pick up a hose or willing to help, you come on, you can go. So I received, uh, not this past December, but December of 20, uh, 2018, I received my 40-year plaque as a member of Grove Fire Department. And of those 40, I just got reelected to my 26th year. As? Chief. So your family has been integral in that fire department since its existence yes, began, sir. and yes, for the sir. past quarter of a century you've been chief? Uh, yes, sir. And what makes Grove unique, for those that may not understand how the Anderson County Fire Department works, are 27 stations, and at one point, we were the largest fire department in the country. When you considered all those right, volunteers, right. 20 cents, we were, bigger. we were also at one time, and I don't know the, the local statistics uh, or, or you know, the past statistics other than uh, about six, seven years ago, I think we were ranked sixth in the nation in numbers. And we were, the, the five above us were all paid fire departments. Right. This, we're all yeah, volunteers. Volunteer. And Grove has the least number of calls every year of anybody. Well, I, I, I think you're right. I'm not counting, but, uh, and, and that's a good thing. That is a good uh, you know, I tell everybody yeah. it's all at uh, fire prevention we do down there. But, but we're fortunate enough that uh, we don't have, uh, you know, that many structure fires and that type of thing. And, and lo, lo and behold, when we do, we've got a lot of folks that come around from other stations and departments that help us, and we appreciate it all we can get. At what point did you get interested in local politics? Well, it was in uh, somewhere around July, August of 1998. Uh, they were having several referendum uh, meetings, uh, town hall meetings around in our area wanting to build new schools. Of course, at that particular time, I had small children in school and uh, I started attending some of these meetings just to see what they were about and it wasn't that I was against uh, what they were wanting to do I just felt like that maybe if I got involved with it a little more than just being a taxpayer then I might could help mold school district 3 and in, you know into what, what there are today um, you know, I've always heard if, if you was a passenger in the car, you weren't controlling where it was going. But if you're the driver, at least you can steer it. 
and uh, I felt like at that particular time that I needed to become a driver because you could talk all the talk you wanted to, but unless you was in that seat, nobody was listening. And um, I think District 3's come a long way. I think we're ranked seventh in the state right now. We got four excellent schools. We've got a lot of good things. I think the one cent sales tax was especially good for school district three. Not to mention we share in the in the school over here called Anderson Institute of Technology. Listen, that has been a game changer uh, for our children. My platform wasn't exactly ran on that back in 1998, but it was certainly you know on the back of my mind that we needed something like one and two had. Um, we had FFA and it taught you a lot of skills, but we needed other things to make that child want to stay in school and, and become you know, a, a better person uh, and, and out here and, and being able to provide for themselves without having to put a lot of burden on their parents, send them to, on to college. You know, everybody, I mean, let's face it, everybody's not a four-year college material. If you can learn a good trade that you can get out and, and, and make real decent wages, have a retirement plan, have insurance, feel good about yourself, be able to you know purchase a vehicle, purchase land or a house or whatever and provide for yourself and your family. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And um, I guess that's what got me in politics is I just felt like that there was more to offer than just sitting back and, and being a spectator. And you've been elected ever since you ran that first time. And yes, that was, wasn't that the first time you ran? That was a pretty rough race, wasn't it? Well, that that was actually the time when that that was on the ballot about the first referendum. Right. I actually got on the board with a seventy thirty percentage, and the referendum failed by seventy thirty. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, good, bad, and different. But I mean, yeah, you know, we came back. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, the new members got on there along with with uh, some of the other members, and and everybody came to a compromise. We actually. Uh, act, uh, came up with a different uh, architectural firm who uh, approached things a little bit differently. Uh, the, the numbers actually uh, demised to the point that it was it, it looked like it was feasible for most folks to, uh, you know, you, you got to think about it. In that, that particular time, that was real new for right. referendums. Yeah. And when you tell somebody it's going gonna, it's gonna to be 17 million dollars, a lot of the folks that hadn't had children in school in a long time, I mean, that was a lot for them to find them, you know, in the world. Yeah. You know, uh, my taxes is high enough. So you had, so we got community involved. We started committees that actually helped us get out here and reach some of these naysayers, and they became on board, and they were actually the ones that were promoting. So we had a pretty good idea that that second referendum was going to, going to pass just because we had community involvement. And you got a great school superintendent. We have a great school superintendent. We sure do. Kathy Hibbs. She's Kathy just an Hibbs. amazing she's girl. She's homegrown. Yep. And uh, she believes in what she does. She loves what she does. She believes in them kids. She fights for them, and she's there early and stays late.